This is the Self Taught or Not podcast with Dylan Israel and Eric Hanchett, where we teach you the do's and don'ts of software development from two software development professionals, one self taught and one not. All right. So today we have the very exciting library episode, the book episode, the, um, you know, the ebooks for the kids that are in the uh the new hotness and they read them on tablets i'm more of a physical book type of guy but we're going to be diving into what books we like why and some recommendations and we'll include links to them in the show notes below which you can hook uh hook us up with some affiliate income if you'd like to yeah i'm really excited about this episode i do read books i know a lot of people nowadays don't read books and but i, I definitely do i think it's just having a physical book in your hand being able to flip through it is really nice. And me being an author as well, I've written two books myself. You know, I'm still definitely on the book bandwagon. Yeah, it's it's sort of a interesting thing because I, I see some people reading ebooks and like that's that's great. I always find my eyes get strained. And sometimes I like to actually um, highlight or I'll like pinch a page and you know put a bookmark into something so I know exactly where I'm at and sort of keep progress. And I they, I'm sure there's um electric electric versions i share there's software in a lot of the you know things like kindles to do that but i don't know i've just never i've only attempted once to read an ebook and i've i've just always liked the physical aspect it makes me feel i but I'm, maybe i'm just old you know what i mean like <laughs> like i don't buy i don't download games either i go to the store and buy the video games that i want to play i mean i also you know beyond just feeling that book like i'm with you dylan on that one just having it in my hands and being able to pinch and put a bookmark in it you know I, I really think there's some books that are just classics especially in our in our technology web development programming world that we have and that they are, are certainly I don't know what the word evergreen maybe so they, they these topics are going to be relevant now just as much as they were you know 20 years ago when some of these books were read and I think that's one of the big criticisms I hear about books in technology nowadays is that as soon as the book comes out the content is already out of date so like i wrote a view book a few years ago and i actually did a whole episode on it you can see it last season um, i'll make sure it's in the show notes and and i could have sworn like as soon as i released it view like did some sort of update now it didn't break anything that was in the book but i couldn't obviously add that update into the book because it's they don't allow us through Manning to make updates to the book after it's published. They don't, you can't like physically go back and update it. But the contents of the book was, is, is sound and like it hadn't changed in years. So even to this day, uh, it's, it's still pretty good. I mean, it came out in, in 2018, but you know, almost two years later, like the content is, is, is sound and there's a few changes and a few things that have been deprecated, but it still works. Now the books we're talking about today are really things that haven't changed over years and years and things these things and patterns are still occurring today yeah and i think that's an important thing to draw attention to is that a lot of these books have been written decade plus ago you know years ago and in technology a, a decade it's like 10x time right it's like 10 years in, in software engineering is like a century has passed in terms of the real world but they've they've held their value and they they've excel uh, i could say for me one of the ways that i was able to accelerate my career and go from a junior dev to a senior dev was going into these books reading them and then rapidly applying it right one thing i think a lot of people do with like courses video courses and books is they just sort of look for like almost like a check mark like oh hey yeah i did this course but they don't go and apply it to be successful with any of these books that we're going to recommend, you need to go and apply it in your day-to-day -day life, whether you're building projects or working in an organization. Honestly, most books and most, I'd say courses, especially cheaper courses, people just buy it. It's like almost like a, an inspirational buy. People buy one of these classic books and they buy it because, I don't know, they have this feeling that if they own this book, that they're, they're somehow a better developer. Or if they buy a course, they feel like they're a better a course. Uh, maybe they're better at that technology that the course was on. But I feel like most people don't read the books they buy and they don't use the courses that they have. So it's kind of a sad state of affairs. But, you know, like to Dylan's point, if you are going to buy one of these books, 
uh, you know, try try to at least read a few chapters. You don't have to read it all if you don't like it, but try to also you know take some gems away. See if there's anything you can put in into your modern day modern day work that what you do every day. I think that's really important. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the maybe more popular books uh, that I think you would see. Like if you did a Google search, you might say, "Oh, hey, I'll see these on the top ten of you know my top ten software books." And also, pretty- oh, Dylan, let me interrupt you for a second. I was going to say, too, we're going to name these books. I am the first to admit I have not read all these books, and I think Dylan can say the same. We have heard of some of them. Some of them we have read, some we haven't. But I think it's good to know what's out there and what people are recommending and kind of our thoughts and feelings and, and, and what we see in it. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, one book that actually um, Ricky, who Eric and I, Garcia, who is a fellow YouTuber, and Eric and I know, he started reading is Design Patterns by Eric Gama. And um, I po- apologize if I mispronounce your, your last name and, and many other authors. So, like, I, I don't want to go through and name the 11 authors for some of these books because uh, usually, you know, you might have one author, but you must, might also have seven or eight authors that um, he he read recently and was like, hey, check this out. It's fantastic. Yeah, the, the, this is interesting. So this is colloquially known as the Gang of Four that wrote this book. Um, it, it has four authors. I won't name them all, but Eric Gamma is one of them, Richard Helm. So on and so forth. I guess we'll go ahead and name them. Ralph Johnson and John Visites. But yeah, they, this was like a classic book. And I remember in my computer science program, I was in my senior year. And they were saying like, this is, we, we went over patterns in our like capstone class. And we had to buy this book and we had to read it. And it is super dry. <laughs> this is definitely a book that was written, I don't know, 20 years ago. But it really has, it really has patterns that you're going to be using today. And it's also really great if you're going into an object-oriented programming world. Uh, if you're interested in those type of programming languages, like if you're jumping into Java or even Angular for with TypeScript or C Sharp, because it really introduces some design patterns that you are going to be using quite often, like the factory pattern or the model view controller pattern or the singleton. I mean, these patterns that you hear about that that you should probably know, especially if you're coming from a computer science background. Now, there has been some criticism of this book because people tend to learn these patterns and then they try to shoehorn them, shoehorn them into their programs. And that's the only, that's like the biggest criticism I've heard is that you don't have to use these patterns. And by the way, by the way when I say pattern, it's almost, you could almost think of it as like an algorithm of like, how do we, this is like a common scenario that happens in software development. Um, th- this is the pattern that we've came came up with, and this is how you implement it. I don't know. What's your thoughts? So this is on my to do list. So I'm actually reading two books right now. We'll talk about them later on in this in this podcast. But Design Patterns is one of the books that I need to read. Like I I understand that it's and I, I've so you, you mentioned Singleton. I've I've gone out on my own and read a couple of blogs about certain design patterns and Singleton being one um, and sort of a, a pub sub uh, design pattern. I've actually applied some of these where it makes sense. I think I would rather have people try to shoehorn things in than just keep doing the shitty code that they're doing, I guess. Um, but I, I I would say it's it's almost like how people like, hey, you need to build small components and but not too small. I don't know that it's honestly that big of a concern. Like I, I think most of the time with design patterns, if you're trying to apply it to something that makes sense, that it's going to be as good as not having a design pattern. Like oftentimes when you're building something, you should have an idea of how this is going to flow and not just work. And I think that generally separates a junior level engineer from a senior level is a junior level will make something work today, but a senior level should be able to have it work tomorrow as well. Yeah, going back to just being a junior developer, I I, you know, I think when you're a junior developer, you just, I would say most have no idea what these patterns are. And if they're using it, they don't know. Like maybe the first time you jump into Angular, you learn dependency injection, which is pretty much very important in, in Angular. But people may not know dependency injection is a popular design pattern. And it was, I don't know if it was originally introduced by the design patterns book, 
by the king of four or if it was um if it came through somewhere else but it's it's a really classic design pattern and you end up using it every day and you probably don't even know you use it and that's a good point i think a lot of junior devs they're just trying to get something yeah just get something working <laughs> like I mean, they're happy if it just comes up. And, and especially if you're using JavaScript and web development, you can cut a lot of corners and you can make you can make things work and just have terrible code behind it. And generally, you know, unless you have a senior developer that's really doing great PRs, I mean, sometimes you can just let it go. But so I guess if, if you're concerned about design patterns, then you're like one level higher than most I would say most development shops out there, especially in the web development world. I, I think design patterns definitely are more thought of in the back end. Yeah, and I, I think that's a mistake. So front end has evolved in complexity quite a bit as we now have, you know, I, I, I've read a couple quotes from developers, I can't remember their names, were like, whoever thought that we live in a world in which there's more complexity in the front end than the back end. And so it's uh, almost a mentality shift at times where your front end usually grows pretty rapidly, much like your services. And being able to make sure that that scales properly is something that's rather important, I think. And um, some of these patterns and principles you can apply in multiple places. But I think it's worth mentioning, like you said, that with JavaScript, it's always been the Wild West. And if you've only ever worked in JavaScript, a lot of these topics that might be covered in this, whether it's dependency injection, uh, the solid principles, you're not really going to have been introduced to it in JavaScript if that was the only language you've ever worked with. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I will say one thing. Um, Adi Osmani, I believe he works at Google. He's big on Twitter, but he wrote a learning JavaScript design patterns. I think this is in 2009, I think. I'll have to check. So it's a little bit of an older book, but he tried to apply those classic design patterns to JavaScript. And um, it's I think it, it worked pretty well. I think this is, I haven't read it, but I know a lot of people that got into creating frameworks. They really used this book as an inspiration for them. And it does get into some of those, kind of takes the design patterns book and puts it in the JavaScript world. Even though I think it, like I said, I think this came out a few years ago and he hasn't updated it. But he talks about like the model view view model, the model view controller that I said before, observables, facades. I'm looking at the Amazon page right now. So if you are looking to to learn design patterns in JavaScript, I would definitely look at this learning JavaScript design patterns book. Let's move on because there's quite a few books we have here. But that's a very important one. I'm glad glad we covered it. I know this next book that that you have a lot of experience in, Dylan, and this is Clean Code by Robert Martin. So what, what's this book? Yeah, so um, the OG, Uncle Bob, uh, who occasionally gets himself in trouble on Twitter. Uh, I don't remember what he got yelled at. I don't follow it too much. But um, Uncle Bob is a long-term advocate for writing clean code. And what that means is making our code more readable, testable, and maintainable. And he's been preaching about the solid principles for quite some time. I would say that this book was a major player in me leveling up my code um, and probably honestly getting me about a 30 or 40K raise in a year just by following this book and implementing it. But uh, it's I, I like it so much that um, probably shouldn't talk about it since we're not there. But Eric and I are working on a project that somewhat inspired by this book that we'll talk about in a future episode. But Clean Code is all about how to write code professionally. That's that's really it. And make sure that when I go back to my code, that I can actually read it and I can uh, make it you know more extendable uh, rather than having to corrupt what's already there and you know make it backwards compatible to a degree. I have this on my bookshelf as a book that I want to read in the future, and I've kind of skimmed through it. And yeah, and by the way, someone, and we're going to be doing this and other websites have done, done this. They've taken all the code examples out of clean code and made repositories out of them. Like this information's out there at a lot of different places. If you don't, if you just Google clean code JavaScript, you'll see like 20 examples of people, 20 to, you know, hundreds of probably different websites, blog articles that people have taken these core ideas and, and presented them in a way that 
you can use for any language and they have ones on JavaScript, Java. You know, it really opened my my mind because once again, going from that junior level to senior level, you need to start thinking about how do I how would I intelligently structure my app? And kind of some of these clean code principles are really good. I think they should probably ask these questions during interviews. You know how the classic interview now nowadays is I mean, you sometimes get a take home test, sometimes you get uh, a whiteboarding test. Why don't we give like a clean code test? Let's let's see. I guess sort of, you sort of can judge that on a take home test. You could see what kind of patterns they used. Um, I think that would tell you how good a programmer is more than you know do a whiteboarding algorithm on the board for twenty minutes. Yeah, to to your point, when I'm interviewing candidates, um, I ask them if there's any principles they follow, and like the go to for everyone is yeah, I do I do dry, you know, and I'm like, well, what does that mean to you? Like, give me some examples. Like, well, I don't, you know, I write this different functions. Like, give me some examples. Like, and that, that to me allows me to drill because the, um, I wouldn't even say clean code is necessarily about, um, like a design pattern so much as, um, uh, different. I mean, it's more principle based than, um, than design pattern. So a lot of examples would be, um, using searchable names, using function names and, um, com- good comments. What is a good comment? And I've actually, done a um basically a two-hour course on youtube called code like a pro dedicated to some of the concepts in this book breaking them down and making them understandable uh but it's definitely pro and it so some some of these books might be at a higher level for people um clean code is not one of them clean code is a book that i think regardless of where you're at in your career that it has value to make you a better developer whether you're just getting started or you're a super senior yeah, we could probably do a whole episode on clean code principles. Like I'm I'm just looking at a few resources right now. Now, like you favor functional programming over imperative programming. So you don't have side effects and every function returns, you know, returns something and has no mutations in the middle. There's a lot of really great ideas here. You can actually really deep dive into functional programming. That might be a good episode too. It's 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 a dark, deep circle of things you can do to be a good functional programmer. Now, here's a question for you, and I, I find that I have a different opinion than some people about this. I like to sort of mix and match um, OOP and functional programming because I think it's that's the best combination. But a lot of people that I've talked about who are big functional programming guys is like functional or nothing. Like, like <laughs> I don't know what what do you, what's sort of your stance on functional programming? I've heard the same thing. Some people who just love OOP and then people like, you know, functional is the way to go. I think in the React community, they've kind of moved to functional programming as the paradigm. I guess you can write some of your, you could take some of the principles of functional programming. And this is talking from someone who's doesn't completely understand all everything with it, but I'm sure you can like create really clean methods that have no side effects or mutations and inside your classes, you can, I think, I think it's perfectly fine to mix and match some of these things. Um, I know some people just don't like the overhead of classes and it doesn't make sense. And I think we've talked about this a bunch of times, but I think it's perfectly fine to mix and match it as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Where it makes sense. I, I, I think more so the, the point I'm trying to make is that when you're looking at some of these design patterns and principles and ideologies, it's not a one size fits all. And oftentimes you might mix and match some of them for your use case just make sure that you, when you're implementing some of these things, that it makes sense and it's the best route to go. Yep. Let me let's go and move on to Code Complete too. Now this is this is another really classical classic book that a lot of people recommend. So it's a huge book, by the way. I have it. I think it's 700 pages. It feels like it's it's a ginormous book. It has a lot of topics, very dry, but a lot of great information in it. So you'll learn things like how does design for minimum complexity and maximum creativity? I'm reading some of these bullet points from the book's cover. Reap the benefits of collaborative development. Av- apply defensive programming techniques to reduce and flush out errors. Um, use constructive practices that are right weight for your project. It kind of almost takes like a whole project management view of it too. It's very research based, kind of academia, and how you do it with this commercial practices. I read about half the book probably like three years ago and honestly i got pretty bored of it and i couldn't finish it but i know you had just picked up this book dylan 
I think you have. Yeah, yeah. So I, I you know, it's funny as I, it is. So clean code, you're going to read through that in a day or two. It's a fantastic read. It's something that's really enjoyable. This book, I don't want to say it's not enjoyable, but it is dry. Um, the Some of the cooler aspects of it is that they include a lot of stats with this. So like most of these books are, you know, they're software is a relatively new industry. So a lot of it's opinion based. Hey, this is a great way to do this. This is, you know, one way of doing this and this is why. But here they include a you know, hundreds of stats from, you know, organizations as to why we should do PRs and things like that. So I'm about, set, it's a, so it's about 900 pages uh, and I'm about 650 or 700 pages in. I'm almost done. I will say the f- second half of the book is a much more enjoyable read than the first half and something I've, I've found more value in. The first half is very similar to other books where I think it excels is in the second half where it starts talking more about um, refactoring patterns and you know going about refactoring your code and good test cases and that's the part of the book that I think it excels at quite a bit but it's um it is dry I definitely wouldn't probably want to make this your first book that you're like hey I want to up my game because this might just stop your game like you might just be like uh that's gonna be the last book I ever read I don't know it's 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 really dry would you say too it feels like I mean Steve McConnell is definitely taking bits and pieces of his career and being in you know, probably management, being a software developer and kind of intertwining and interweaving this whole book together. So it's it's pretty hard for develop it's pretty hard for beginners. But also I remember it's been a while. I think it's very object oriented programming focused. Like a lot of the examples have that OOP background. Yeah, that that's definitely correct. And multiple languages is, are used in this book. Java and C Sharp, if I remember correctly, are sort of the main ones. But there's even like Visual Basic. I will say at times certain examples feel a little outdated. Uh, but that doesn't mean like there's things in there talking about compilers and things that you're really probably not going to think about on a day to day basis. Um, but by and large, it's pretty good. It, this is much more of a... Um, textbook i would say like it reads like like if you ever remember reading like a college textbook it's gonna feel more like that than a lot of other uh, books on this list so maybe it's good to pick up but you know be prepared it's gonna be a little dry and might be sort of boring the next book on the list we have is called the mythical man month and this was another book that that i picked up during college and it's kind of more like essays on uh, software engineering. That's, in fact, part of the name of it. And so it goes all the way back to this guy's experiences in working for IBM and how they managed the development of OS 360. So it, um, one of the classical things that you learn in the Mythical Man Month is how projects are run and how um, management deals with it. H- have you seen this book yet or is it on your list? Yes. So I've actually read this book back when I was in college. Um, and this introduced me to the um, the sort of so a lot of great examples in businesses of how they just throw resources at problems and like, hey, well, we're having we're, we're behind schedule. Just throw at, you know, two times more developers and get twice the, the effort. And a big part of one of these essays, one of the more popular ones is how that doesn't really work. And if I remember correctly, the example that the one of the essay authors give is the um one baby nine months and so they go nine mothers one month baby and so that's sort of the equivalent of software engineering but i I did read this and i i found it very enlightening uh, to have an understanding of what the industry is like uh at least that that's what i remember about it from god maybe seven or eight years ago when i was in college yeah i i remember the exact same thing this is funny we actually just recently, um, in the last few months, I was talking to a project manager, and uh, they were said, "Oh, you know, with the software projects behind, we're going to transfer some other people to go ahead and and work on it." And then someone, I didn't say this, someone's like, "Have you guys read the Mythical Man Month?" <laughs> and everybody's like, "What the heck is that?" Like all these project managers had no idea what this was, and well, they, maybe they did, but they didn't say anything. So the idea, as Dylan just pointed out is like typically in software development projects, when things go long, it's this kind of idea that we just throw more resources at it. So, you know, if something is 
going to miss its deadline. Let's just put three more programmers on it. But one of the classic examples in this book is that when you add more resources to something, it's going to have a lot more complexity to it. And it's not easy to just break a project down into smaller pieces. And there's a ramp up time that it takes for developers to actually learn the project and to, to jump on top of it. And then the communication time, when you have one or two developers, it's easy when those two are just communicating together. But when you have like four or five programmers and you have five communication channels, it becomes exponentially harder for everyone to talk and communicate together. So typically what happens is these projects go over. Um, so I just think it's funny. It's just to this day, it's still happening. People are just like, let's just throw more resources. Let's just throw more programmers at this project because it's it's going over flow and people don't realize that that's usually not a good pattern to do. And and then that same, that same uh, idea of like how, you know, project managers think, you know, if you want to make a baby in less than nine months, you can have nine mothers in one room and they can make a baby in one month. So that, that's pretty funny that you just mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the general idea. And the, the, the funny part is that this was published in 1975. It is 2020 people. Like it's like 45 years later, we're still dealing with this craziness, but, um, so very cool papers, something that's quite fun to read. And, um, you know, I, I don't see, I don't, I don't remember it well enough to tell you if it's going to make you a better software engineer, but I do think from what I remember, just setting expectations of what the industry is like, it's definitely going to help you with that. You can put that on, put that on the list of something to check out and you can get all these on Amazon. So like oftentimes you think like academic papers, where well, you can get that from some science journal that you've never heard of, but not, not the case. Yeah, for sure. I, well, I want to touch on this topic for one more minute. Do you think there is, I mean, because I've talked to a few project managers that say, well, if we spend enough time breaking down the tasks of what's remaining, we can bring another programmer on and it can reduce the time the project needs to be done. But I still think that like there's diminishing returns. It's not like you put one more programmer on a project and it's going to split the time in half that it takes to do. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely the case. Um, so you can definitely automatize, automatize. You can make your stuff very small, <laughs> and uh, um, you know people can can work on it. But you start running into the same issues where oftentimes these things aren't broken out ahead of time. Like in an ideal world, this is how this is how the real world works. Is hey, we want this, we want it faster than you say you can deliver it. So your team of six is now a team of twelve, uh, and they start next week without giving them any ramp up time. You know, it takes, you know, there's been studies to show that the ramp up time takes anywhere from three to six months, like to actually get up and running and work in those technologies and, and so on and so forth. And then there's diminishing returns where you're stepping over each other, you're working on stuff. It's just, uh, you know, every study that you're ever going to see is going to say, oh, well, we doubled the cost of this, of the, we doubled the amount of developers, we should get twice the return. No, it's, at some point, it's like you get like 20% more return and 100% more frustration, it feels like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on to the pragmatic programmer. So this is by Andrew Hunt and David Thomas. Not not the David Thomas from Wendy's, a different David Thomas, if you guys are following along. So this one is really interesting. I read this uh, a couple years back as well. You know, what's is interesting, I put all the books that we've read together at the top. Some of these books I have not read. But I remember this book as being just a really easy read. It's not that long. I want to say it's only a couple hundred pages, maybe even less. And it just goes into, and it's been updated a few times. I still think it's a little outdated. But they, it, uh, it, they but, just updated this year, actually. Because I, I just, it's, it's funny you have this on there. I bought it like a month ago, but they just released a 2020 edition like two months ago. Nice. And I know it, it just, it talks a lot in like plain speak. It doesn't read like a textbook. It's a pretty easy read, and it just talks about all these different example, examples of software development, kind of the processes. Um, it talks about like real-world scenarios of people maintaining their code, um, how you delight your users. Um, it talks about personal responsibility. You know, if we're going to talk about another book about later called The Ultimate, uh, John Sonmes' book, the – what's it called? The Complete Ultimate. Software Developer's Career Guide. Right. This feels like this would be like a prequel to the complete software developers life guide because they kind of cover the same topics a little bit. Um, but you can see this this is pretty well done. It's it's talked a lot about career development, architectural techniques, and keeping your code flexible and easy to adapt and use. Yeah, I, I would actually um, – and I, I say this, I've only – I'm reading two of these books. When I get sick of reading um, – uh, what do you call it? Code Complete. I, I hop into the Pragmatic Programmer. 
And I would actually, from what I've read, only being a quarter or a third of the way in, is that it it's it lines itself a little bit more to clean code where it's about very practical changes that you can make to your code as well as a mentality aspect. So uh, one of the cool things in here is you're going to go through the book and at the end, there are this hundred tips for programming that you can actually pull out of the, at least the new edition of the book and sort of have that as a mental note of what to apply. But it's, it's a really easy read. It's one of the books I think that if you want something, a gate, a great entry level book to get going where you don't want something too dry, too complex. This is a fantastic book. That's what I remember. I did my edition. I don't think it had those hundred questions. So I, I need, I think I need to pick up the latest one. Cause that sounds like that would be really useful to have. Yeah, I just remember. I just remember it did have some great examples, and it, it had a little bit of psychology and like career development in it too, which was nice. Yes. Speaking of career development, there's a, a book that um, is also by Uncle Bob called The Clean Coder, that is all about how to act in the professional realm. That this is if there's two books that I'd recommend more than anything else on this list that you read, it's Clean Code and The Clean Coder, where Clean Code excels in teaching you about how to write code. The Clean Coder teaches you about how to be a software engineer and what that means and you know how to protect your craftsmanship, how to you know deal with the business in the sense of not like antagonizing them, but so much as being able to make sure that you're working with them and they're working with you and uh, you know giving reasonable timelines and things like that. I would definitely recommend that if you're looking for a book about the industry and how to act within it, The Clean Coder is a fantastic read. Since we're on this topic, uh, let's let's jump to John Sonmez's book. So his book, it's called The Ultimate, you just said, The Complete Software Developer's Career Guide. And this is really a soft skills book. And what I mean by soft skills is we're talking all about uh, how you should act, how you should behave in a software development organization. What are some things that you're going to learn? It has a pretty good testing chapter. It talks about different types of tests and how to work. It, it pretty much was John Sanmez talked about he worked in the industry, uh, software development industry for several years. It was like, this is his magnum opus of everything he's learned. He was, he did, I know he had a, a pretty good testing background, but he also did development for quite a few years. So it goes over so many different topics. And this is another really, really fat book. And by the way, John Sanmez, a little controversial too. I haven't seen what he's done on Twitter. So keep that in mind. But um, as in his personal life, he's a little controversial. The book itself is very, it just has a tons of different topics in it. Like even talks about coding boot camps. It talks about um, like how you dress at interviews, how to get interviews, how to put together your resume, for example. It, what technology stack should you learn? I mean, a lot of the stuff that me and Dylan have talked about on our channels for years, he's written down in this one place. Yeah, and this was the book that April said, hey, I'm thinking about going to a coding boot camp and starting a career in software development. I said, okay, before you do that, read this. Read this. And, and you know, not all 900 pages books are created equal. This book has, you know, bigger font and it's a little bit more animated and stuff like that. But it's a large book, that's for sure. But the book covers everything like it's just a it's an introduction to everything is how i would describe it when it comes to software development what technologies to consider what how to interview how to get the job salary negotiations um, working with recruiters consulting it's sort of if you don't know how the software industry works by the end of this book you're gonna have an idea of what it's like and you'll sort of have some sort of it's gonna fill in the gaps of everything that you didn't know in a general sense. It's not going to get super deep in any one direction, but it's definitely going to talk about everything. And because of that, it's a great introductory book to read. I think I read it in three days. I loved this book. This was something where I went out of town on like a camping trip and I read it uh, over the three day weekend and I was done with it. I loved everything about the book. So I think it's a great introduction book to about a little bit of everything really. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I did like the book quite a bit. I never got through it all. It's just it was so huge and so many different topics. I kind of used it as a reference guide when I wanted to learn something. I would just flip to the chapter, talked about it, just read it, read it over. So th that I, I really liked. It is a mile. What's the word? It's a, a wi mile wide and inch deep. So some of these topics he barely gets into. 
but I think it kind of gives you that breadth of knowledge so you can kind of look at all these different things without getting too deep. And maybe that's not his, I don't think his specialty is any one of these topics. Like I bet if you put John Sanmez and ask him like some really technical code and, and clean code, he probably wouldn't be able to do it off the top of his head. But I think he would be able to tell you the general idea of clean code. And that's what he gets through this book. Yeah, and I, I think that was his intent because there's so much that when you're getting started, you just don't even know the questions to ask or what even exists. Or like, oh, that's a thing. This is going to tell you that this is a thing. And like, it's going to just sort of briefly touch on a lot just uh, maybe to expand your vocabulary and expand your, your base. To, uh, just be aware of what's out there. Let's talk about a few more books. We have a few more minutes. Uh, Cracking the Coding Interview. This was a book that is probably one of the top recommendations people talk about when you're trying to interview for a whiteboard type interview where you're doing, going to be doing some algorithms. Its uh, author is Gail Lackman McDowell. She's been really good too of updating the book. It's been updated, I don't know, five, six times. And she even has her own community now. I think she even sells some digital products with it. So if you buy the book, you can even get more um, more help from her. I think she even has a, her own algorithm site. But it's it's usually one of, one of the top selling books in the computer science world out there too, because this is essentially how developers run. Uh, this is basically how developers do whiteboarding interviews, especially for Fang or Facebook, Google type companies. Yeah, and this is a book I own, but I've only gotten like two chapters in. I was like, yo, I'm not ready for this. Like, this is, <laughs> you want to talk about dry and hard. This is a book, but it's if your goal is to go and get one of those fang type companies, this is the book, right? This is the holy grail of algorithm books that, you know, she, I, I forget her exact background, but it's very impressive where she's worked at like Facebook, Google, and Apple or something like that. And it's just was like sniping off these top tech companies one by one and wrote this book and it's done hundreds or thousands of interviews probably at this point. This is the book that's going to prep you for that. And it's going to be a lot of hard work to go through it. But I, I definitely, from people who have done that, have sworn by it and they learn quite a bit. And um, it's a hard book though, definitely a hard book. Yeah, if you have no computer science background whatsoever, you've never taken like an algorithms class or read some blog articles on it, and you jump into this book, it's going to be a little bit of a learning curve. Now, if I remember correctly, half the book is her explaining the algorithms, like what's a binary search, what's what's a graph traversal, and she'll go over all these common book, um, these common algorithms. But the second half of the book is algorithm problems, so you'll have to take what you learned from the first half of the book and then apply it in the second half of the book. And then she'll have like easy algorithm problems, medium and like super hard algorithm problems. So you, if you're going to go through this book, you're going to have to try to do all three. But I, I believe if you are able to go through every algorithm problem in the book, you are going to be well on your way to land a job at Facebook or Alphabet or Google, wherever, because this, this goes into quite a bit. Now that's probably one also kind of caveat, I guess, or I guess it's it's one problem with the book is that all it is is it, most of it is just algorithm problems, which but at this point, there's so many websites, there's so many services that offer that, that you can definitely learn this without buying this book, but I, I think it's still a good purchase. Yeah, I mean, it's it's in the name, right? Cracking the coding interview. This is all about breaking through really for those high end interviews. And, you know, nowadays there's so many algorithm sites. I, I couldn't tell you if they do it better or worse than the book. Cause I not been something I've particularly focused in on my career. Some point I want to though, I, I, I sort of want that check mark of like Microsoft or Google on the resume. And at some point I'm going to take this copy and I'm going to actually read through it and put in the six years it's going to take me to complete this book properly and, and see what see if i can make that dream come true and i've heard of some so we we're both youtubers me and dylan and the one of the trends i've seen lately in youtube channels is people who are either ex facebook or ex google engineers or people who got jobs at facebook or google and i've seen a couple of these guys do videos and how like this is how i got into facebook and all of them 
almost all of them are like, okay, I got cracking the coding interview. I got leak codes, which is a website that you can use algorithms. And I did an algorithm every day for 30 days. And then I, then I jumped it up to the hard algorithms and I did those for 30 days. And I, you know, after doing this for, you know, two to three months, I finally was ready to go and get a job at Google. So I, I, it's definitely very, very difficult and it, not everybody gets it. And then there's always that one guy that's like, oh yeah, I just graduated and I, I got the job in Google, you know, one interview. And you're like, how did you do that? You know, when I was in school, I'm going on a little tangent here. I mean, maybe you had this too when you were in school, Dylan. We had a the ACM. Um, I think we, we've been both a part of ACM, which is the Association of Computer Machinists. But one of the things that Computer Club had in our college was programming contests. And back when I was in college, like back in my day, in the mid 2000s, I feel kind of old here, we put on these programming contests and they were pretty much like these leak code type questions that you see today. So they were really heavy algorithm based. There were a lot of really interesting things. And that's what we did in college. Like we would go through and we would hold these co programming contests. We would have two divisions, a lower division for everybody, sophomore, sophomore and lower then one for a junior and senior and we would give out prizes and we give like five algorithm type problems and people would just finish him and whoever finished the most in the time allotted would win and then sometimes we'd even get sponsors from local companies in town so it feels like this would used to be like a way that computer science students learned uh, we would do these these uh, programming contests and then they would have like national ones too and and regional programming contests and and I think that's part of the reason why this this kind of culture came up of, of doing these whiteboarding interviews because you had to be really smart to be able to to pass them. Yeah, and competitive programming is programming is definitely a thing. It's actually one of the items that I've considered getting into. Like one thing I miss about maybe my my youth. I'm not that old. I mean, thirty two by development years is past thirty. You're a dinosaur. It feels like sometimes for some people I work with, but um, it's uh. It's competitive programming is one of the things I, I be, being in competition is something I miss, right? I did sports and, you know, I used to play games where you do like ranked. And one thing that I would like to do that I think would be somewhat productive is getting into that competitive programming sort of item and going through these books and these courses that, I mean, that would be the place to start right now. I think they would just put me on the bench. I don't know how <laughs> they'd be like, dude, what are you doing here? Uh, but lots of, uh, lots of cool stuff when it comes to that. Yeah, yeah, and I know there's even I think Facebook even does their hacker rank. I think it's called Hackathon Hacker Rank. They have a yearly programming contest where anybody on pretty much anyone can join and then start submitting and they have algorithm problems that get progressively harder. That kind of interested me more than just spending, you know, two months studying algorithms to try to get at it get a job. Maybe having fun at the same time would, would be the way to go. Yeah, and a, lo a lot of these algorithm sites nowadays, you can just like, oh, hey, I want to apply to this company. This company partners up with, let's take Code Fights, for example, because I know this is one of the things they do. And same thing with Hacker Rank, where you can go and they'll just say, hey, take pass these three algorithms on our website and we'll set up an interview with you. Like, that. that's it. And so this is becoming a, or has become, I should say, a more common way of maybe accomplishing that goal. I just don't really like it because I, I haven't found it and maybe because I haven't put the time in to be as super relevant as the amount of time and energy invested. Like I, it's, I don't like putting time in just for an interview. I, w I want to better my skills that is for maybe my actual job. And not to say that it's not going to benefit you, but I mean, even the title of the book, Cracking the Coding Interview, it's not like it's not how to get good at algorithms and data structures. It's how to get how to pass the interview. Yep. Let's let's talk about two books and then we'll finish off. Uh, one is, and specifically for web development, I've heard a lot of good things about the HTML and CSS design and build websites by John Duckett, and he also has a JavaScript and jQuery interactive front end web development. They're a little bit dated because <laughs> talking about jQuery, but these are kind of colorful books. They have a lot of great examples of CSS. I have looked at them in the library, have not read them. Have you heard about these two? I have, and they seem to be the go-to recommendation. The thing I would say, um, this is just my personal opinion, I've never read a book on HTML, CSS, and definitely not jQuery, but generally speaking, I would say this book at first glance is 
meant for entry level people. And I think the best way to really learn HTML and CSS is just to build stuff. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong in that aspect, but um, you could definitely learn something from any book. I, I would say that this these ty- books that cover that those specific technologies, I'd be more inclined to not read a book about it if that makes sense. Like I like I like the general sort of programming books that are less topic oriented and more principle or design based or um, very practical in nature. Like you can apply it in multiple languages, multiple um, frameworks, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I tend to agree, but I still hear from people that buy this book to this date and they still love it. So it, they did something right. I think it's just how colorful it is, how easy it is to learn. Now, I don't know if it has the latest and greatest in HTML and CSS and and all the different preprocessors out there, but I, I, I still think people get a lot of value from this. I mean, I'm, see, I'm looking at the Amazon and they have like five-star reviews from 2018, 2019, just because um, it has HTML5 in it. Probably doesn't. I don't even know if it has Flex or Grid in it. I'm sure it has Flex. I don't know about Grid, but I I, I think people still still really like this book, and I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. And then it, the la- go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, as far as specific technology books go, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. That's the core front end. So if you're gonna be working in front end development, that would probably be something I'd be more okay book related wise. Uh, because those are the core technologies. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't focus too. Like, I don't know. I don't see HTML and CSS going anywhere anytime soon. I guess is what I'm trying to say. The last book is this is a classic book. I've always heard people recommend it, and I read it. Well, I read some of it, and that's JavaScript: The Good Parts by Douglas Crockford. So JavaScript is a a very notorious programming language for having a lot of kind of stuff that you don't need to use and a lot of stuff that you probably should use. So Douglas Crockford actually wrote a book about the good parts of it, which is kind of funny thinking about about the title of it. And it kind of goes into um, like Ajax, like the stuff that you should be using for it. It's a very technical book and it's a little old. It hasn't been updated in a while. So you're not going to see like ES6 examples, which I think is the modern way of writing JavaScript now. I mean, everyone's using arrow functions, template literals, classes in some cases. But I think this is a, a good book just to kind of understand things you probably wouldn't even uh, know about, like closures and things like that. Yeah, in that same vein, um, in a similar book is uh, You Don't Know JS by Kyle Simpson, which is multiple short books and i think he actually just released a new version of it this year i saw it on linkedin i don't remember i think he might have changed the name slightly but another great javascript centered book to explain the um some of the stranger parts of javascript i guess yeah actually i've had re- i have not read it but i know he gave it away for free i think at one time you yeah know, JS. yeah the um the ebooks are free Uh, as far as I remember on uh, Amazon. So yeah, so that would be highly recommended too. I know Kyle Simpson, he is pretty big in the JavaScript community, does a lot of conference talks. It's it's really good hearing people like that talk. Yeah, Yeah, and shout out to Kyle Simpson, man. I... A little side note on on him. I was on LinkedIn trying to get a hold of the LinkedIn content creators and be like, hey, I'm submitting a course, but I'm not even getting a response back. And I posted, Kyle Simpson hooked me up, said, hey, can you help this guy out on my post? And was able that was that was how I was able to finally get in contact with LinkedIn Learning for the course that I'm building for them. So shout out to him for hooking a brother up. All right, that's pretty awesome. That's one thing cool about our industry is that we're so young. Like even these books that were in 15 years ago, these authors are still alive. A lot of them are still going to conferences. The the books that are like the creator of React, you could probably meet if you just go to the right conference and and talk to the right people. And Kyle Simpson, uh, obviously, he's, his books are a lot newer. I'm not saying he's old, but it's cool that we have such a close knit community that he would help you out like that. All right, I think that's it. That's all I have. Do you have any other books you want to recommend? Uh, I guess the only other book I'd recommend. I'm I'm a big Uncle Bob uh, nut writer, for lack of, <laughs> lack of a better word. Uh, I watched the Boondocks the other day, and so the um, that was a term used for one of the episodes um, for Thuglicious. But anyhow, 
I, I digress. Clean Architecture is a fantastic book that goes into more architecture heavy um, design patterns that by by Uncle Bob to make sure that everything is um, scalable quite quite nicely. I'd, I definitely recommend maybe wait till you're a mid or senior level to read it though. Um, but that's that's pretty much all I got. If there was one book that it, so if you're listening all the way to the end, by the way, thank you. Fifty minutes in, I really appreciate it. But if Dylan, if you had to recommend one kind of junior level book between all these, which one would you recommend? I would definitely recommend either Clean Coder or The Clean Coder. I, I would fall on The Clean Coder because I think juniors really suffer with how to interact with the business and how to give timelines and how to um, how to handle stress because it can be a very stressful job at times. I think this book will teach you how to be a professional in software engineering and really make sure that you're successful long term in the industry. Sounds good. I agree. Same one. Or or John Sonmas' book. I would recommend that too. Yep. Lots of good stuff. And again, we'll include uh, links in the show notes here uh, so that you can go and check them out and you know get some good stuff. Sounds good. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you want to find more about what I'm up to, go to dylanisrael.com. And if you want to know what I'm up to, you can check out my website at eric.video. If you haven't already, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And if you do, you might even be featured on our next episode. Don't forget to check out the website at selftaughtornot.com. From there, you can sign up for a mailing list where we give away free courses and a bunch of cool stuff. And we'll also let you know when the next episode comes out. And finally, if you didn't know, we have a Facebook group. It's called Code Tech and Caffeine. We have over 10,000 members and you can find the link at selftaughtornot.com. So come join us. We have tons of developers willing to help you guys, mentor you guys. Check it out. Just make sure you go to selftaughtornot.com and check out the Code Tech and Caffeine link. Thanks and take care.